Welcome to presentation number five in our series, Retrieving Romans. Today, the topic is Retrieving the Voices. There is more than one voice uh, in this letter. Now, let's look at where we have been. So, when we do, <coughs> when we make a symbol, this the symbol of our reading, we are looking under a magnifying glass. We are expecting to find things that we might not see with the normal eye. So we are scrutinizing. We are, in fact, reading as retrieval, not just reading, oh, good habit, we've heard that before, we know that by heart. But we are discovering things that we have missed out, that we have missed that's what it means to reread and retrieve. And then, <clears throat> second topic, retrieving why. Why was this letter written? We considered four options. We concluded in favor of the option that says that Paul wrote this letter to counter the influence of counter missionaries. And we gave a host of reasons why that is the strongest uh, answer to the why question. And then as our third topic, retrieving ecology, human and otherwise. And we looked at the context of Romans. We got acquainted with Phoebe, who carried the letter, with Prisca, Aquila, and all the friends Paul has in Rome. And <clears throat> that sets the sort of setting, it means that the Romans had advanced knowledge of the theology of Paul, that, there were, that he was represented in Rome before he came and even before the letter came. And then we looked at the letter opening where there is a, where Jesus is born, he is, he is incarnate, he is the son of David, and he is resurrected from the dead. There is a body there, there is earth, there is space, there is time, and there is ecology. And then we looked at the faithfulness of God, retrieving the faithfulness of God, looking at that key text in Romans 1, 16 and 17, as it is written, and then <clears throat> hearing the echoes of Habakkuk. Now, the faithfulness of God, meaning that is to look at something God does toward us, is different from faith in God. That is what we see in relation to God. God's faithfulness is a broad, has a broad range. He's faithful to human beings. He's faithful to non-human beings. And he's faithful to the earth. <clears throat> so here... Looking at Habakkuk then, the text that anchors uh, a message in Romans as it is written. And <clears throat> we had in Habakkuk the problem of God's absence, the problem of God's apparent absence, not God's anger. And then an answer to Habakkuk, God will demonstrate his faithfulness. He will surely come. And then... <clears throat> Unrolling the scroll, as it were, we have the message, the righteous one shall live by my faithfulness. In contrast to the traditional reading, re living by faith, our faith in God or God's faithfulness to us. <clears throat> well, we're moving on. <clears throat> Here is a page from my commentary. This is how I do the outline of Romans, and I have put the headline pivots in Romans. So you can see there are first pivot, second, third, fourth, and so on, covering the whole book. So that those are sections, a kind of outline. And a pivot means that there is a change of direction, a turn, a kind of inflection point. And how to catch those is quite important. So I want to look at it from <clears throat> the beginning of, of uh, the book here. So 
the introduction covers verse 17. The righteous one shall live by my faithfulness. That's how it ends. So there is a synopsis of the message in the first seven verses. He writes that he likes he would like to come to Rome in the next uh, uh, seven, eight verses. <clears throat> and then he has a thesis statement. God's right making is revealed uh, from faithfulness for faithfulness, as we looked at last time. And then there is a pivot. There is, in 118 to 32, there is an indictment of Gentiles, I put that in inverted commas, by an unnamed interlocutor, an unknown a voice. We don't know exactly whose voice yet, but that is the first pivot. And then there is a second pivot. I call that the second and decisive pivot, where there is a change of direction again, a kind of turning point where there is a harsh pushback and in some ways a put down of the unnamed interlocutor that we heard here. There is a kind of pushback toward that voice and there is an alternative representation of Gentile reality in the remainder of chapter 2. Now these are big things just by way of introduction and we will look at the details to see how this adds up. I also want to call them strange pivots because there is, there is so much uh, going on. The sort of shifts are so uh, marked. So first <clears throat> we had this problem of God's absence or apparent absence. Going back to Habakkuk, why are you letting me see so much injustice? Why don't you do something? And then <clears throat> The promise to Habakkuk, God will do something and the righteous will live by my faithfulness here. But suddenly the scene shifts from the problem of God's absence to the problem of God's anger. God's wrath is revealed from heaven here in 118 to 32. And then another pivot, Paul speaking and seeming to be angry with that voice we heard talking about God's anger, God's wrath, and that's in chapter 2, uh, <clears throat> verses 1 to 3. So we see these verses, this is uninterrupted. Going from 116 and on, there is no interruption in the text, but there are pivots within the text here, and we want to catch those. <clears throat> Under the headline, Retrieving Voices. So here again, problem of God's apparent absence, problem of God's alleged anger and rebuke and rebuttal of the voice and viewpoint in 118 to 32. Here is how I wish to uh, make that work. This is one voice, that's another voice, and that's the first voice again. So there is a kind of shifting of voices here, and the way to illustrate that is here, that the person who reads the letter can, by body language, tone of voice, represent more than one person. You can speak, you can change your tone of voice, your dialect if need be. You can sound harsh, you can sound happy, you can sound angry. You can do all kinds of things to make it seem authentic in relation to the message and the sort of person you wish to uh, to convey or, or, or represent. So, so here is the mask for number one, the voice one, and here is the mask for voice two. That's how it works. And there are books written about this, how this is actually a fairly good representation of what is going on in Romans here in chapter one. <clears throat> Let's read. We're beginning in 116 to 17, and it is voice number one, and I'll explain my illustration in a moment. Let's read. <clears throat> For me, there is no shame in telling the good news. <laughs> no, because it is the power God uses to save everyone who believes, the Jews first, and now also the Greek. Yes, 
The good news shows how good and faithful God is to do what he has promised. It shows how the faithfulness of one leads to the faith of many. As the scriptures say, the righteous one will live by my faithfulness. So here, there was a problem, the problem of the God who is absent. But the message is a message of a compassionate God, a God who is present, a God who feels the pain of the human condition and who intervenes faithfully. That's the uh, symbol. But then <coughs> we have a voice too, <coughs> and another kind of face, an angry face. And yes, the speech in 118 to 32 is animated. It is harsh. It is in some ways quite eloquent. The person who speaks there has thought it through. It is almost like a stump speech, you might say. Something that was a speech given more than once. But the tone is angry and the message is also angry. Well, we also see how God shows his wrath against all the bad things wicked people do. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. And that is a somewhat angry type of indictment. And <clears throat> we have an illustration uh, for that. So, and this is a sort of big type of picture of, of Christian, of the under, of Christian theology in some ways. Where does it begin? It begins with human sin. It begins with the wrath of God. And everything else is a kind of response to the notion of the wrath of God. And Romans 1, the way we usually read it, is a key text, a go-to text for that understanding. Wrath of God, mercy of God after that, but it begins with a notion of God's wrath. <clears throat> Let's read on. <clears throat> for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. And here as an illustration of the sort of darkening of the mind that is depicted in Romans 1, 21. <clears throat> Still on voice 2, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. And here uh, we have documentation, we have evidence in the ancient world that things along those lines did indeed occur. This is from Egypt about 3000 BC. And these are lion figures that are represented as deities, objects of worship. So there is evidence for the way the text runs, but there is more uh, than meets the eye here. And therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 124 to, uh, let's see, here, uh, to 25. And I have an illustration here, Hier Hieronymus Bosch, uh, and the haystack here where you see the human condition depicted and all kinds of strife and conflict and, and, and depra depravity here. You can Google it. This one is in the Prado in Madrid, and it's worth a study. <clears throat> For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. <clears throat> and I found this one here because there is a kind of picture that counts as a, as a sort of cultural uh, degrading in 
ancient times. This is the city of Pompeii, and it was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in AD uh, 79, uh, uh, and it was preserved. It's like people froze. It's like there you are seeing images of people and uh, the wall paintings, everything has been uh, restored. And you see a culture that where there is clearly a preoccupation with eroticism, with sex, and those images I could have shown you, but I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> Let's read on. <clears throat> Their women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men, giving up natural in intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And here again, it's a, it's the, uh, the, this is a, a triptych. It's a three scenes from Hieronymus Bosch. The Garden of Eden, Paradise Lost, Expulsion from the Garden, Present Reality here, and here, punishment in the end. Uh, and punishment were depravity and punishment is sort of inter intertwined. Uh, so, <clears throat> and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. And here you can imagine this as the debased mind. God gave them up to that. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents. And my illustration here will be gossips and slanderers as a feature of, of this culture. <clears throat> Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And my illustration here is a weak one, but you can make this work for ruthless, as it were. And then <clears throat> the concluding verse, 132, we have read now through all the verses from 118 and now to verse 32. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. So <clears throat> here is an illustration, and in some ways this could work for a way faith communities talk about unbelieving the world and the depravity in the world the no excuse, the deserve to die, that as a premise for the gospel, that there is divine wrath against human sin, and then, of course, there is on that premise a message of mercy. But this is how we begin to start it. So <clears throat> just to, to probe into the logic of this indictment and, and look at it a couple of, couple of things summarizing. So they knew God. They did not acknowledge him as God. Therefore, God gave them up. And there is this idea that idolatry comes first and then immorality. And then <clears throat> they exchange the natural for the unnatural. That is describing the immorality. And they deserve to die. There is in all of this a kind of sense of a culture that became like Sodom and Gomorrah. And there is the implied tone, sort of back, it is implied. Look what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. That is the uh, implication. Now, <clears throat> since this is a text that is used against same-sex relations and homosexuality, uh, and uh, 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 that it is a go-to text for that, I just want to make couple of comments, but I am not making that my topic, but just a couple of comments. So in this text, idolatry comes first and then immorality. 
that is not how things work for many people who are gay. I have been a doctor for many years. I have talked to many people who define themselves as gay or homosexuals and who live in stable relationships. And for them, it did not begin with, with idolatry. It began with, began with a sense of who they are. So this causal nexus in the text, the movement from idolatry to immorality, is hardly the way it is in, in the problem or the, the issue that we are discussing in our time. The other thing is that this is a kind of <coughs> sexual free-for-all. It is clearly not sexual expression within loving relationships. So we might need to mute or to sort of retreat from the usability or the relevance of this text when we discuss the issue of same-sex relations today. But that is not my point. <clears throat> my point is something else. <clears throat> we would not, it would not harm us to you to discuss this text uh, in other ways too in relation to that topic, but I want to move on. So, and given, <clears throat> given the sort of eloquence and the logic of the indictment and the way Gentile reality has been depicted, why in the world, why in the world would there come a rebuttal? Why would there be voice one again, speaking as it were back to voice two and saying, wait a minute, why would, that be, would there be such a harsh pushback? And to preserve the force of that pushback is a key element in how we read this letter. And yes, that pushback is often missed, even though some people have tried to do justice to it. So this is in my translation. You therefore, O oh virtuous person, and virtuous here is a kind of sarcastic uh, uh, expression. You therefore, O oh virtuous person, have no excuse, you and all who judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. Uh, and here we have an illustration. Uh, this is a person who is taking a selfie and is quite happy with himself because the condemnation of the speaking voice in 118 to 32 also implies virtue on the part of the person who speaks. I call it in my commentary, chauvinism of virtue. That that is the sort of uh, self-understanding. He has a certain view of himself and a very condemnatory view of the world. <clears throat> Reading on, <clears throat> do you imagine, O virtuous person, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape? the judgment of God. So there is a put down here, the, there is a smugness uh, on the part of the speaker, as we noted, and we are just wondering why this pushback? Why does he set up such a give and take, such a back and forth at the beginning of the letter, and in such harsh language? <clears throat> we will have two options to make sense of this. <clears throat> and the, uh, this, what we are looking at here is called, <clears throat> in technical terms, prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia. Prosopo is the word for face in Greek. And poeo is the word for doing or making. So prosopopoeia is a person who makes faces who changes faces, that is to imitate faces, to play roles, as it were, uh, that you could have. And the two options I am giving for this to understand what we're looking at here, 
these two options are both elements. They both fit the sort of notion of prosopopoeia. <clears throat> now, since I'm talking to medical students as my primary audience, I want to recommend to you a book. You will be a better doctor if you read that book. I'm thinking of Oliver Sacks' book. He was a neurologist who came from England, but uh, worked in, the, in New York City. He's written many books. The most astute clinical observer I know of. So these, uh, the book I'm thinking of is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. A patient he had in his office, a music teacher, who had lost the ability to recognize faces. He had had a small stroke in the occipital cortex. Uh, in the center where the ability to recognize a face is located. He, had, he was perfectly normal otherwise. He could not recognize faces. He had prosopoagnosia, inability to recognize faces. <clears throat> Just to make you see that this word has <clears throat> a, an application in medicine. So the two options here is number one, that it could be a teaching technique in the hands of a clever pedagogue. So Paul constructs a scenario with two speaking voices and opinions that he will eventually set in opposition to each, to each other. So there is a, a pivot, as it were, inside the argument. And then and the second option, speech and character where you are playing roles for the purpose of exposing and confronting real people that threaten the mission. So in this example, in this option, Paul constructs the two voices. Here we have a real voice. Voice two is a real voice. It isn't Paul. <clears throat> and again, this works for both, that you are sort of making faces, playing roles, body language, tone of voice, to match the message you want to bring out. <clears throat> so the first option here is an option that gives us a clever Paul, a person who really knows what, how to get sort of the better of his audience, as it were. And I have Richard Hayes here, who is my mentor and friend, and I agree with almost everything he says about these texts. But I don't quite agree on this one. I think <clears throat> that might not work quite as nicely as he thinks, but I think it is a very amazing pickup in a way and a promising option, as it were. So, so <clears throat> uh, Richard Hayes calls what we are witnessing here a homiletical sting operation. Homiletics is the art of preaching. So Paul is here putting on display his skills as a preacher. And here is what uh, <coughs> he says. <clears throat> Romans 1, 18 to 32 sets up a homiletical sting operation. It lays a trap. It creates an ambush in the text. The passage builds <clears throat> a crescendo of condemnation, declaring God's wrath upon human unrighteousness using rhetoric characteristic of Jewish polemic against Gentile immorality. It whips the readers into a frenzy of indignation. Amen, amen, you know more, say it again, uh, against others. Those unbelievers, those idol worshippers, those immoral enemies of God. And when we look <clears throat> at it, uh, at this, uh, these texts, it is actually like a catalogue of vice. And in Greek, all these words begin with an A. It means that the, that the virtue or the characteristic uh, described by that word when you don't have the A, that everything is lacking. A senetos, a dokimos, a synthetos, and so on. You see the list. Uh, in English, we can't reproduce that, the sort of beauty of that uh, rhetoric, the, uh, the 
force of the rhetoric, we have to resort to others. But sense and senseless, you see how that works? Shame and shameless, worthy and worthless. So less, we add less to our words and it works, but we don't, we cannot do, the for, do it for the whole list. But let's read the list. Senseless, shameless, worthless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, disobedient, inexcusable, ungodliness, wickedness, impurity, degrade, degrading passions. This is really harsh rhetoric. This is a harsh description of human reality, a sort of dictionary of vice. Volume 1, <clears throat> letters A to G. I made that illustration. And then there is a, also the sense of a kind of drumbeat, Jew, Jew, you, that you have for every sentence here. And it is the vile they described by a virtuous I. The speaker has virtue and the others <coughs> are vile. <coughs> they are without excuse. They did not honor him as God. They became futile in their thinking. Their senseless minds were darkened. They became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. That one is twice. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. They were filled with every kind of wickedness. <clears throat> so there is then <clears throat> an implied smugness on the part of the speaker describing someone other than himself. He is not <clears throat> a sort of target of that indictment. And now back to Richard Hayes. <clears throat> the surprise in Romans 2.1. But then, in Romans 2, 1, the sting strikes. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. And just to <clears throat> set us up, something is going to happen here. It's an homiletical sting operation, that's what he calls it. And then the sting strikes, and the sting here is the rebuttal, the rejoinder, the pushback in Romans 2, 1 to 3. That was not expected. And this is where uh, Paul's skill as a, in homiletics and preaching uh, shows itself. And <coughs> others <coughs> have actually support this notion that what we have is a clever Paul who exposes false virtue in this way. And James Dunn, he says that Paul's attack is aimed most directly at what he sees to be a typically Jewish attitude. Uh, Douglas Moo says that although some application to self-righteous Gentiles cannot be entirely removed from what Paul says in 2, 1 to 11, it is clear that Paul's main target is the Jew. It's Jewish self-righteousness he wants to target. <clears throat> and then Brendan Byrne, he's an Australian expert on Paul, he says that the tactic is to erode Jewish confidence of being preserved from God's eschatological wrath on the basis of a privileged position with respect to judgment. So all of them thinks that this is, that he wants to target Jews and he targets them by making the Jewish voice speak in 118 to 32, not knowing that they are sawing off the branch on which they are sitting, because he will say, you are doing the very same things, and you are also worse off because you are so conceited in your sense of your own virtue, as it were. <clears throat> so, the two options then, the teaching technique option that Richard Hayes promotes and the others that I refer to here, and this option, a speech in character option, where the voice speaking in 118 to 32 is not a fictitious voice, it may not even be a Jewish voice, but it is a real person not a constructed person. 
It is, in my understanding, the voice of the counter-missionary. That's the other option. Speech and character for the purpose of exposing and confronting real people that threaten the mission. mission. And so and the concern that lies behind it is a pastoral concern. It's not a clever Paul. It's the earnest, caring Paul that we see. But these illustrations work for both, except that now we have the voice of Paul in one mask and the voice of the counter-missionaries behind the other mask. I'm making this as explicit as I can. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> what do we have? This fits what we have concluded, what we have learned of this letter already, doesn't it? Because who will steer the Gentile mission? And what will be its character? So we begin with a contest for the character and the sort of who carries the portfolio of the Gentile mission. And I am not making that, sort of imposing that view on Romans. There is clearly that contest there. And it is also in Galatians. And what will the message be? Where one group has a vision of inclusion, that's Paul, and the other wants to preserve identity. That is the counter-missionaries. You have to be circumcised and so on. So that context. And then <laughs> the character of the, of the mission, the character of the message. Is it the compassionate God who looks with kind eyes on human reality and wishes to come to our ex assistance? Or is it the angry God and uh, the wrath of God as the premise for the message? That's where it begins. God is angry first. That is the first step, and that's how the counter-missionaries see it. <clears throat> so, Looking at these options in these columns, then options for the first question in Romans, because 2, 1, 2, 3 is the first question of more than 70 rhetorical questions in Romans. So here, <clears throat> the scenario here is that it's a diatribe, a teaching technique made by a very clever teacher. And here we have a pastoral intervention by a person who is clever enough but he is most of all a caring pastor. And here we have a fictitious opponent constructed by the clever teacher, but here we have real people. He doesn't need to invent them. They are actually there. There is no problem finding them. The speech in both scenarios is harsh. The issue here is Gentile vice and Jewish hypocrisy here in this diatribe. But here, <clears throat> it is mostly a rejoinder. So someone is speaking here in 118 to 32. Maybe he is describing Gentile vice. But the, it is the force of the rejoinder that is the main thing. Here in theology, there is a line that runs from sin to wrath to retribution. Here, the line runs, as we will see more clearly as we move on, from need to right-making. And the perspective here is punitive, or mostly punitive, and here it is revelatory and redemptive, and we will <clears throat> learn more about that as we move on. So, for these strange pivots, here Paul speaking about the solution to the problem of God's apparent absence that Habakkuk raised in, with such force. And then <clears throat> we have <clears throat> another voice now carrying this message of God's wrath or God's anger. And Paul, in a kind of angry way, very harsh rebuke of the speaking voice here in 1.18-32. to 32. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I'm going to summarize and then I... Uh, as time permits, I want to tell a little story. So communication is more than words. It is also tone of voice, body language, gestures, and facial expression. That's basic. 
Now, you can also do that in a letter, except that when you read the letter, you have to infer it. You don't get it <coughs> handed to you. Number two, there is a change in topic and tone as we move from 116 to 17 to 118 to 32 and to 21 to 229. The text pivots. And the passage 118 to 32 begins with a ringing missive centered on the wrath of God. And number four here, it implies that there is a punitive logic in history that anticipates an ultimate punitive horizon at the eschaton. We are reading this to retrieve voices and now some other comments. So the shift from the problem of God's apparent absence here in these verses to God's alleged anger in these verses is not only a change in topic and tone, but also a change of voices. It's another voice. That's what I have tried to show. <clears throat> the second voice is not constructed by Paul and thus a fictitious voice. It represents another person or other persons who is not Paul. That is what I'm trying to show. The second voice <clears throat> need not be Jewish. It is not given uh, that the counter missionaries were ethnic Jews. And, and just to illustrate this with this book by Stanley Stowers uh, from 1999, I believe, a re-reading of Romans, where he explores some of these issues of the rhetoric of Romans. My view does not agree with everything he says or vice versa, but he does have awareness of this Vo uh, notion of, of shifting voices. These points we have read already. Now to some more points in this column. The indictment itself is rhetorical and not simply descriptive. It is both condemnatory and smug. I think we have seen that. The rebuttal <coughs> in 2123, you do the same thing works better when applied to a specific person than it works as a group characterization that the Gentiles do it and the Jews do the same thing. Well, maybe so, but that is not as good an explanation as confronting counter missionaries who may be more hypocritical than you had thought possible. That is a better theory. <clears throat> so the text here will say God gave them up. Three times we will hear that. And then later in the letter, God didn't give them up. God intervened. God shows his love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And God did give someone up. He gave up himself. That's later in Romans 8. <clears throat> and Moving still down my list, how should Paul, this is an issue of strategy, how should Paul talk at the beginning of the letter as he puts his best foot forward? How should he talk if he wanted to win support for the Spanish mission? Should he say, well, God is really angry with those people out there in Spain, those idolaters, and I need to go and tell them about it? Or is God's attitude to those people out there in Spain, those barbarians, something other than anger. This is an issue of strategy. Or same thing in relation to the weak and the strong. If the weak in the Roman congregations are Jewish, would it be such a good idea to come down so harshly on alleged Jewish self-righteousness as the traditional reading has it. And then <clears throat> what about the missional imperative later in Romans? They are without excuse, the voice number two says in the beginning. But here and later, they are, have an excuse. How are they to believe in one whom they ha of whom they have never heard? So you need a revelation, you need a message in order to be enlightened. You were not that from the beginning. My final point, Paul, 
Is he a clever pedagogue? Or is he an earnest pastor? He is both, of course. But in our reading here, it is the earnest pastor that wins out rather than the clever pedagogue who creates homiletical sting operations. <clears throat> I'm concluding with a story from my own life. Fifty years ago, <clears throat> this is my home village. It is actually called Tonstad, but I have my last name from my village. The village is not named after me. <clears throat> so here we are. Uh, this is not 50 years ago. There are more houses now than when I grew up. But this, is, this yellow house here is my childhood home, and it's still there, and my brother has a house here up on this hill, and this picture is quite recent. <clears throat> and then uh, looking at our village from the other side, now standing in our house or uh, on the property, we are looking out at the village. More houses now than when I grew up. Here is the village church. And you have mountains on both sides. And as a child, I thought I will never leave this place. This is where I belong. I felt very much at home there. But I did leave. <clears throat> 50 years ago, I had finished high school and I was about to take my first step out in the world. Uh, I traveled to Beirut, Lebanon to study theology at Middle East <coughs> University or Middle East College, it was called at that time. Just before I did that, my father died in 1971, that exact year. And I was bewildered and grieving and things were you know, unstable as it were. And I needed money to go to school because we were not a well-to-do family. And just as luck would have it, we had a hydroelectric power plant being constructed or having been constructed in our village, in, our, in, in the mountains around there. It is the, one of the largest hydroelectric plants in Europe. <clears throat> so it's huge. And there had been an accident inside the mountain in the tunnels that carried the water down to the turbine. So they needed to put in an emergency crew to make a detour around this place where there had been a rock slide. And I got a job working 12 hours shifts and in three weeks <clears throat> earning enough money for my tuition <clears throat> for a whole year. On one of the last days at work, I thought I need to say something to my, uh, my fellow workers, my fellow villagers. I may never see them again. It's my only chance. I need to witness to them. So I thought, what should I do? And the conviction <clears throat> dawned on me that I needed to, I wanted to share with them something from Romans. I wanted to share with them Romans 1. I found the Living Bible that had just come out. I translated the, that paraphrase into English and I copied, made copies on paper copies. And during the lunch break of one of my last times with my fellow workers, I said, I want to share something with you. And I brought out my papers and I shared Romans 1, 18 to 32 with them. And the text begins like this. <clears throat> the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and humans who hold the truth in unrighteousness and so on. It didn't go over well. It was awkward. It was embarrassing. My fellow villagers felt ill at ease. They felt that I had ambushed them, and I had. And they felt abused because they were reading a text faithless, heartless, ruthless. It seemed exaggerated. It didn't seem to fit the type of persons they were. Yes, they were not perfect, but they were not heartless, faithless, ruthless, and so on. The sort of exaggerations there, the sort of amplifying or the rhetoric <clears throat> in Romans just didn't work very well with them. I did not realize at that time that I was not a missionary in the tradition of Paul, but a counter-missionary. I was the voice to which Romans is opposed in my witness to my fellow villagers. 
it took me a while, some years, to discover that. And I have been back to my village many times. I have not met my fellow villagers. This is the tomb of my parents. My father died in 1971, and my mother, Hilda, who was his second wife, later, first wife died. She died eight years ago. And I just want to say to you that I am older now. I hope I am wiser. And I hope you will be wiser than I was when you read the letter to the Romans.